For module 7.3, we're going to look at deriving candidate keys, okay? And so we're going to start with a relation and a set of functional dependencies, and we are going to be able to identify what attribute or attributes in that relation make up a valid candidate key. And we're gonna use two approaches for this, the synthesis method and the decomposition method. So the synthesis approach is described in detail on page 375 of your book. And be warned, this description is going to get a little bit dense and it's gonna be a little bit dense going through the decomposition method as well. But this is one of those things that we're just going to practice over and over again and ultimately it's going to make a lot of sense. So given a relation schema R and a set of functional dependencies F, for this relation R, we are going to find a subset of attributes for this relation such that the closure of this set F includes all attributes of R, okay? So basically, we want to find a functional dependency where the dependent includes all attributes of R. We're gonna find some set of attributes that will be the determinant and the dependent will include every attribute in our relation. All right, so basically, given this relation R and this set of attributes and these three functional dependencies, and these are the same three functional dependencies that we just looked at, what is a candidate key of this relation R? All right, so we're gonna start with the synthesis approach, and this is the quickest way to do this, but also the most error-prone way, and the way that you're, you're most likely to make a mistake. So you have to be a little bit more careful this way. So we have this relation, A, B, C, D, E, G, H, and these three functional dependencies, B determines G, H, A determines B, and C determines D. Let's find the closure for these uh, attributes in our semantically obvious functional dependency. So A, we've already looked at this, A functionally determines B, B functionally determines GH, so the closure of A is A, B, G, H. The closure of B is just B, G, H, right? And neither G nor H functionally determine anything else, so we can't go any further here. And then the closure of C is just C and D, okay? So none of these so far functionally determine all attributes in our relation, which is what a candidate key is going to do. A seems to do the most, right? So I think that's probably the best place to start and now let's think about what things A does not yet functionally determine. And C is one of those things, and C functionally determines something else. So that would be a good thing to try to add. So the closure of AC, like we just saw, is A, B, C, D, G, H. As I mentioned previously, it's not gonna do any good to add E or add B to our determinant because AC already knows everything that B knows. And the only attribute we're missing is E. Yeah. So through the augmentation axiom, we can add E to both sides, right? So we can add E to the determinant and to the dependent. And at this point, our dependent includes every attribute in this relation R. So ACE functionally determines A, B, C, D, E, G, H. Therefore, ACE is a candidate key. So in this fairly simple example, the synthesis approach was pretty straightforward and is, is going to be kind of the quickest way to work through it, but kind of easiest to miss something. So. We're gonna do this same 
real set of a relation and set of functional dependencies using the decomposition approach and see if we get the same answer. Hopefully we do. <coughs> so in the decomposition approach, we are going to start by setting all of the attributes in our relation to a, a an or to a set of attributes k, which is definitely going to be a super key. Okay, recall that since every tuple in a relation must be unique, then it must be true that the value of every attribute in that relation together can uniquely identify that tuple. Okay, so it must be true that the combination of every attribute in the relation is a super key. The combination of every attribute in the relation is going to have the property of uniqueness. Okay, so we start by saying every attribute together, that's a super key. Now we're going to remove attributes one at a time, and we're going to ask the question, this thing that was a super key, when we remove this attribute, can that super key minus that attribute functionally determine the attribute we just removed? And if the answer is yes, then that new set of attributes without that attribute we removed must also be a super key. And we remove attributes one at a time until that super key is irreducible and then we know it's a candidate key. If that super key or if that set of attributes with that attribute removed cannot functionally determine the attribute that was removed, then we know it is no longer a super key and that attribute has to be added back. We'll work through the example and that'll make a lot more sense. So, same relation, same set of three functional dependencies we're going to start with a super key that we call K of A, B, C, D, E, G, H. This is just all the attributes in the relation. It should be obvious that, uh, that this set of attributes A, B, C, D, E, G, H can functionally determine A, B, C, D, E, G, H, right? That's just reflexivity. So now we're going to remove one attribute from this set k and call it k prime. So we remove h and then we ask, does k prime, which is a, b, c, d, e, g, functionally determine h? So if we know a, b, c, d, e, g, h, can we fig, or I'm sorry, if we know a, b, c, d, e, g, can we figure out h? Well, if we know the value of B, we can figure out the value of H. So yes, since K prime includes B, we can use B to figure out the value of H because of functional dependency one, okay? So we can remove H and this remains a super key. It remains unique. So now we say that A, B, C, D, E, G is a super key which can functionally determine every attribute in the relation. Okay, let's try again. We're gonna remove another attribute from K and call it K prime. And we're gonna ask if K prime functionally determines G when K prime is A, B, C, D, E. Or said another way, if we know A, B, C, D, E can we functionally determine G? Well, again, if we know the value of B, we can functionally determine the value of G. So A, B, C, D, E is a super key. And so now K becomes A, B, C, D, E. And this set of attributes functionally determines every attribute in our relation. This is a super key. We don't yet know if it's irreducible, but it is unique. Okay, let's remove yet another attribute. We'll try to remove E. So now the question is, does A, B, C, D functionally determine E? Ah, 
I don't think so. I don't see anything that functionally determines E. Except we know, of course, E functionally determines E, but nothing else here will tell us the value of E. So if we know A, B, C, D, then no, we cannot figure out what the value of E is. So we know that E is essential to making this super key maintain the property of uniqueness. Okay, A, B, C, D does not functionally determine, that's what this symbol right here means, E. So we have to put that back into uh, K in order for that to remain a super key, okay? So K remains A, B, C, D, E. So we're gonna next try removing this attribute D. So does K prime functionally determine D where K prime is A, B, C, E? This is the E we had to put back in. We couldn't remove this, okay? So if we know A, B, C, E, can we functionally determine D? Well, yes, because if we know the value for C, we can figure out the value for D. So we don't need D to be in our super key, okay? So we can get rid of that. Now our super key is A, B, C, E. Let's remove another one. We're gonna to try to get rid of C. Can A, B, E functionally determine C? Uh, no, I don't think so. We can't figure out the value of C based on A, B, E, so we have to put that back into our super key in order for it to remain unique. Try one more. We're gonna remove B and then ask the question, does A, C, E, and C, E, remember we had to put back in after we tried to take them out. If we know A, C, E, can we functionally determine B? Well, if we know A, we can functionally determine B. So the answer is yes, we can get rid of B. Now our super key is A, C, E, and A, C, E can functionally determine A, B, C, D, E, G, H, every attribute in the relation. Finally, we're gonna to try to remove this last attribute, A, and ask the question, does C, E functionally determine A? Uh, no, nothing functionally determines A except A, so we have to leave that in the, in the super key in order for it to remain a super key. So now we have a super key that can no further be reduced, or that can be reduced no further. We have a super key that is irreducible, which is the definition of a candidate key. So ACE is a candidate key, okay? Same, uh, same candidate key that we found through the synthesis approach. This is just a kind of more stepwise progression to uh, get there, rather than building up by finding the closure of each of our sets of attributes, or each of our sets of determinants. So ACE functionally determines A, B, C, D, E, G, H, can be reduced no further, so it's a good candidate key. Now, one thing you may know about candidate keys is that there can be more than one of them. Okay, so we're not going to see this in an example tonight, but we will see it in our examples next week and in assignment four, uh, which will be assigned next week. In that if we have, um, if that any of the attributes that make up our candidate key are dependence in any of our functional dependencies uh, that we were working with, there may be additional candidate keys that we can derive. So we'll work through this process uh, kind of over and over again, deriving additional candidate keys, and eventually what we're gonna find is that it kind of creates a loop, and at that point we're going to know that we have found all of our candidate keys. So, uh, I feel like we've looked at a lot tonight, so I don't want to dive into that extra step of complexity, but we're going to work through a number of these problems next week, and we'll see exactly what that means. But I would encourage you to kind of work through the examples that we've looked at in class tonight, and there are a few additional examples in the book that might give this some additional clarity. 
So then finally, once we've identified our candidate key or multiple candidate keys, we can choose among any of them which one we want to be our primary key. So really any of them are, uh, it, it's our valid choices to be our candidate key. But generally speaking, a kind of rule of thumb would be to find a candidate key that has a small number of attributes, attributes that are of small sizes or typically easier to work with, um, and a candidate key that is a determinant in our set of semantically obvious functional dependencies probably makes uh, sense from a business perspective, like might make uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, have face validity or make sense from a business perspective. So a lot of options there, but you just kind of have to figure out what makes sense for the particular problem. And then sometimes uh, we'll find that people use surrogate uh, primary keys or just kind of make up a value that has nothing to do with the data at hand. That uh, is a practice that we do see used quite often, but at that point you're just kind of adding additional or additional attributes that don't really mean anything in particular. So where possible, it's better to use natural primary keys rather than these uh, surrogate keys. So just something to think about as you're doing your design. And then uh, one more thing that we're going to be uh, addressing in Next week's lecture and a little bit more depth is this idea of key versus non-key attributes. So when we've identified these candidate keys, recall that any attribute that is a proper subset of our candidate key is going to be a key attribute. And any attribute that is not a subset of a candidate key is a non-key attribute. And a candidate key is neither a key attribute nor a non-key attribute. A candidate key is just a key attribute. And actually, I just noticed there is a, an error right here. So an attribute that is not a subset of a candidate key is a non-key attribute. This word proper should not be here. So let me, let me fix that. And I'll actually re-upload this slide deck to uh, reflect that small but important change. So an attribute is a key attribute if it is a proper subset of a candidate key. And an attribute that is not a subset of a candidate key is a non-key attribute. And a candidate key is just a candidate key. 